must say I wasn't uh, in the uh, panel that awarded that, this uh, kind of projects, and I think it would be very difficult for me to award any of those because I would give the prize to everyone. I was really impressed. We had 18 uh, entries, and all of them dealing with different uh, research questions using digital collections from the library, so I was really, really impressed by the level of uh, uh, project and uh, the kind of outcome of the interface they created. So, uh, but I had to be sele selective here to give the presentation. I can't talk about the 18 uh, project. I'm going to talk about three projects which deal with different kind of content from our uh, collections and then announce the running up and the winner for this specific category. The first project, and I'm a bit suspicious to talk about it because I was uh, partially involved on it as well, is the Digital Music Lab project, which is really uh, interesting because you're trying to analyze music from a very groundbreaking uh, position, which is more like using visualization tools to analyze music and not using our ears. So for uh, the Digital Music Lab, we have uh, a collection from the BL, uh, the Sound Archive collection. We have more or less 50,000 uh, audio files from our collections, uh, 30,000 on world and traditional music, music sorry, and 20,000 on uh, uh, classic music. And we link this data set with other data sets from Charm and I Love Music. There are two big, uh, large data sets that uh, use uh, some of them more connected to popular or jazz, but ours was classic and world uh, music. Uh, the idea here, as you see, and I think that I put the link on the slides, and I think these slides are going to be made available to you later on, so you can play and look at the interfaces. I'm not going to show them here because I don't have enough time to do so. So what we do, we try to visualize, you can work on a specific set of music or genre, let's say classic music, and you can get like patterns of, uh, for example, the most, fa most common chords played in classic music. And you can generate those patterns, and you start to do an automated way of classifying the files themselves. Uh, here we can see, I think it's more like you can use on the top level there, you can, use, uh, you can choose your uh, repository and you can work on a specific composition so you can also look at how a single performance is uh, uh, changed over time or in, even in geographic locations. The second uh, project that I found very interesting is this encomium by George Etheridge. Uh, George Etheridge was a, a professor at Oxford and uh, he, he wrote this text to uh, Queen Elizabeth I when she was visiting Oxford uh, in 1566. So what the platform does, it looks at uh, the alignment of words in the text and in the H HTML version. And then we're trying to look at uh, uh, the production of the, uh, of, of the original, but in connection to um, how the text has been transcribed translated, how we can link it to online dictionaries, editorial comments, historical philo uh, phil uh, philological annotations, and paleographical uh, information as well. So you're looking at the manuscript from very different perspectives, not only from the linguistic or literary one, but you look at the various ways that it can be combined so we enable or the project actually enable scholars to talk to each other from different fields. And I think this is a very important uh, aspect of digital humanities that we are promoting through this project as well. Third project, which I found very interesting and for me, for me it's really, really important, is the Explore This Text. Explore This Text is uh, innovative, by the way, that can we use the, one, the, the uh, 19th century Microsoft Books collection that we have here at the library that originated the one million image that we had on Flickr. So here we're using, uh, looking at the books themselves. And uh, in, when you do a search on a kind of a digital uh, platform, what happens is that uh, we have uh, specific maps, again, that keyword that we use. But sometimes uh, the items, the digitized items, the way they are organized in the physical world is not replicated in the digital environment. So what we try to do here is to put the stacks side by side. So if I find a book, if I click on the, I'm not showing the interface uh, there, but you can test it. If I put a word like Alice, I can see each stacks, the word Alice or the, uh, as a title or as a subject word appears. So, but I can also, once I'm there in the title, I can look at the titles that come in the physical environment. 
close or on the side of that specific title I'm looking for. Because sometimes the title is not described as Alice or Stories or anything like Oxford, but it might be that a book by the side of the one that I'm looking at might contain some information that I need and I haven't seen it because the digital environment doesn't offer me that opportunity because of the metadata. It's not well described. So it's a nice way to search in a specific catalog. And uh, as a librarian, that for me is super interesting. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, the prize now, and uh, the running up for this specific competition is called, uh, was this project called the Telling Edinburgh Stories with Maps by Palimpsest. The idea here is to, uh, this project, it geolocates more than uh, 1,600 locations in Edinburgh, mentioned in over 47,000 literary uh, uh, books or works from around uh, 550 books. So the idea here is really to create a map where we can see subjects being discussed in uh, this uh, specific area of Edinburgh. So we do uh, also a keyword, and you can find, you say, cat or dog, so you can mention any kind of historical uh, character. So you can find where in the literary world these specific uh, uh, names appear in a map. So again, it's mixing up an important, uh, two important uh, data here. One is the literary itself, but visualizing it in a map, which for me is uh, like Katrina's work, it's very important nowadays, and we can't escape the world of maps in the digital environment either. I'm now very pleased to just announce the winner of uh, this uh, competition, or this specific uh, part of the competition which is the combining tax analysis and GIS investigating the representation of disease in 19th century newspapers. This is done by the Special Humanities Text, and uh, I would like to invite Ian Gregory to receive his prize. Well, uh, thank you very much for that. I'm uh, really pleased to be able to, uh, to accept this on behalf of really quite a large team of people that have been uh, involved in this project uh, over a number of years. The list uh, of names there, Paul Atkinson, Andrew Hardy, Daniel Kershaw, Amelia Julian Jay, Catherine Porter and Paul Rayson, as well as myself, are just people who are working on it at the moment. There have been others, uh, a few others who have been involved in it over the years as well. We are um, a five-year project funded by the ERC, uh, which has really been looking at how we can combine geographical information systems, which is my back background, with corpus linguistics to conduct new analyses on a range of different subjects, and particularly on Lake District literature and on 19th century public health. 19th century public health is really my interest in this, uh, but we've been doing Lake District literature as well, just for a bit, <laughs> a bit of light relief, something a bit more cheerful than dead people. Um, <laughs> The main sources we've been working with, and this gives some idea of what I'm going to talk about today, are a corpus of Lake District writing, which was about one and a half million words of text. Uh, some 19th century public health and census reports and so on, which stretched to about 13 million words of text. And the British Library's 19th century newspapers collection, which we think is about 30 billion words of text. Uh, it's well over a terabyte of data. And that step up from working with tens of millions of words to working with tens of billions of words is a really significant one. And it has caused us a lot of problems at times, but also has uh, opened up a lot of opportunities and provided a lot of interesting challenges uh, that I want to talk about today. Because I think these have got major implications both for digital scholarship and for humanities scholarship and for the interfaces between them. So, uh, whizzing over that very quickly, what happened was, um, about three years ago, um, two people from Lancaster came down to the British Library to copy off the 19th century newspapers collection, put it on a disc, spent all day copying it over because it's a big collection, uh, hopped back on the train, brought it up, back up to Lancaster, um, I spent another day, or maybe more than that, copying it onto machines where we could uh, at least begin to start working with it. And from there, in theory, um, all sorts of interesting results should start falling out. 
Well, that isn't really the way it works. From there, you've got an awful lot of work to go through before you can even really start to, uh, to get to what I would call the really interesting end of the research, certainly the kind of humanities, uh, the traditional humanities end of the research. But those, are re those have thrown up some really interesting research questions and some really interesting methodologies in their own right. So the first thing we had to do simply was uh, the newspaper's text looks a little bit like this with its original markup on it. It has, um, if you look down uh, near the bottom here, you can see that each word in the corpus is surrounded with, object level with word level metadata which says where it was in the page which is useful if you are wanting to highlight the results of search terms. But if you're actually wanting to put this into corpus linguistics software for analysis, it's just a pain. And so we need to get rid of all that. On a small corpus, that would be a relatively trivial job. You just write a small program and it takes it out. But on a large corpus like this, it's more complicated than that. And we had to resort to uh, mounting it up on what's called a Hadoop collection or cluster or something, I don't really understand it myself, uh, which would then allow it to be parallel processed. So the idea is rather than just one processor working through one word at a time effectively, you cut the whole thing up, it all gets sent off to various different processors, uh, the work gets done, it gets brought back together at the end of it. Even once we've done that, the sheer size of this is still too much to uh, load up into the existing corpus linguistics software that we're using, something called CQP Web, which is pretty sophisticated but can't really cope with more than about a billion, a bit over a billion words at a time. So we're still in a process where we can work on one newspaper, one continuous run of a newspaper at a time, uh, but not on all 30 plus collections at a time. But still, that's not bad, because being able to have access to an entire collection of one newspaper uh, as it ran over 100 years is still a fairly amazing thing when you think about it. But we're still actually not in a position where, uh, at this stage, where you can actually, the, the material is still unproblematically usable. OCR error has already raised its ugly head today, and it certainly raises its ugly head in this, uh, in this collection. We were aware of that before uh, we got involved in it. Uh, there are two usual, standards, uh, two usual approaches to dealing with OCR errors. The first is simply to ignore them, and the second is to throw your hands up in horror and say, it's got error in it, I'm not touching it, what a waste of money. Neither of those are particularly sensible uh, approaches, in my opinion. Uh, OCR error is present in an awful lot of material and uh, is one of the big challenges I think that's holding back research in this area. We sat down on several occasions and worked out whether we could uh, improve the OCR on this. We've made two serious attempts on it. The first one we gave up on. The second one got a bit further, but those two statistics there, the recall and the precision, what the recall says, we put a lot of effort into this, but what the recall says is effectively that it was missing three quarters of the errors that it should have hit. Uh, and the precision says that when it did make a correction, only half of them were right. So that... That was based on a, a gold, comparing with a gold standard corpus of about 160,000 words. Uh, what that tells us is, despite having made a lot of work on that, put a lot of effort into that, actually, we were probably going to do more harm than good if we did try to do that. So we decided not to progress with that. But we also found a commercial tool called Overproof, which we tested as well. We were assuming that it wasn't going to be much better, but you can see from the statistics at the bottom that actually it is actually pretty good. It's correcting over half the mistakes, and it's usually doing them properly. Which is interesting uh, and throws up yet another question of, well, if it's a commercial company, A, what's it doing with it, and B, how much is it going to charge for a collection uh, on this scale? And I suppose, C, who is then going to pay for it? Uh, these are collect uh, uh, questions that are still to be addressed uh, and probably aren't for us today. The other question, though, is if a collection has OCR errors, does that matter? Is it really that important? The answer is it depends what you're doing with it. For browsing, it probably isn't. For keyword searching, it almost certainly is, because by definition, if you type a keyword in uh, and it's got an OCR, uh, uh, it's trying to match something which has OCR errors in it, it will miss it. We're actually not, interest, not so interested in that. We're interested in what's called collocation. Collocation is a corpus linguistics technique, which effectively says, if I have a search term, what other words are, are occurring near my search term? Uh, or to put it slightly more... Uh, correctly, what other words are occurring near it more than I would expect? So it gets rid of words like the and at and so on, and hopefully uh, tells you what themes, what other words are being associated with the search term that you're interested in. 
What we found testing that was actually, depending on the measures you use, OCR error doesn't seem to matter that much. T statistics, which measure the statistical significance of your collocates, are broadly reliable. MI scores, which tend to favour small numbers uh, and are used in ranking how significant uh, collocates are, do need a bit more caution. But nevertheless, I think you can use techniques like, like collocation, even in the face of re relatively no uh, noisy OCR, relatively, reliable, relatively reliably. So that's a nice finding. That was something that was quite a relief. So having gone through all that, what are you actually going to do with it? Well, this gives a fairly easy example to start with, the kinds of things that we're thinking of. Um, looking at, uh, so I'm, I'm a geographer by training, so I'm interested, really interested in what's being said about different places and how that changes over time, how different places are being represented. This is quite a simple example, looking at two, two, uh, two countries, France and Russia, in one newspaper, The Era, which was published between 1838 and 1900, published weekly over that period. And you can see that, um, so uh, in green, the, the green line on this is a uh, number of mentions of France, with the dotted line being relative frequency. The red lines are Russia. And what that would make you think is both of them are being talked about a lot, but those spikes there tend to uh, coincide with major political or military crises, like the French Revolution, the Franco-Prussian War, uh, the Russo-Turkish War, etc., etc. So that starts to generate a hypothesis that maybe interest in these places is actually being driven by war, by upheaval, by disturbance. We can test that a little bit further by using uh, collocation again and also a, a technique called semantic tagging. Basically, semantic tagging runs through the corpus and identifies what type of word each thing is. So G3 as a, as a class uh, is words associated with war. So what's on these two graphs in the dotted, uh, the, so the thin solid line is showing mentions associated with just war. The dashed line is showing all collocations of France or Russia that are also collocating with G3, uh, words associated with war. And um, the, uh, the solid line is showing the total mentions. And what that is showing quite clearly is, yes, certainly major political uh, up, upheavals do matter, but actually you can see that certainly in some periods, particularly the latter part of the 19th century with France, an awful lot of the interest in the country is nothing to do with war and major upheaval. It's to do with other things. What are those other things? Well, we can use collocation to get into that. Uh, this is showing a whole different set of potential collocates and how they change over time. Uh, showing how the different ways that those countries are being represented changes as we move uh, through time. I'm interested, though, in representing places in a more sophisticated way than that. I'm actually interested not just in country names, but in lots of different place names, place names as many as we can find. To, to get at those, we've been using the Edinburgh Geoparser, which is a, t uh, a tool developed by a woman called Claire Grover at the University of Edinburgh, who's been very helpful uh, in providing this to us. It's basically a two-stage process in which, first of all, natural language processing techniques are used to uh, automatically identify place names in the text. And once it's identified those, they're then matched to a gazetteer, which gives us coordinates for those place names so we can read it into GIS and start mapping it. We could attempt to throw the entire corpus at uh, the geoparser. Two reasons for not doing that. First of all, it would take weeks, uh, literally weeks of processing time alone. And secondly, um, the results of the geoparser are fairly good, but they're a long way from perfect. And sorting out the error would be, or even knowing how much error was in there, would really be very difficult if we went down that approach. So what we've been doing instead is using a technique we've called concordance geoparsing, where we can start with a search term. It could be war, it could be a disease, uh, whatever you like. Uh, you start with that search term, and you use corpus linguistics software to extract 50 words of cotext around that search term. So the 50 words before it and the 50 words after it. We then geoparse those, but we can then, because you have a relatively manageable set of data, a relatively small set of data, explore those results for error, you can uh, update the errors, but you can also add those updates to an errors file, a corrections file, of which you then build up. So as the process goes, you're cumulatively correcting for errors, spotting errors, correcting them, and you can have a fair amount of confidence that your geoparsing is actually working and manageable, which I think if you went about it in the more conventional approach, you wouldn't have. So we've been doing this with a number of diseases. Uh, 19th century diseases is what really interests me. 
Uh, this is not geopars, this is just raw mentions of <clears throat> three different uh, classifications of diseases. We've got uh, respiratory diseases like whooping cough, uh, fairly significant killers in the 19th century. Uh, diseases of food and waterborne diseases like cholera, diarrhea, dysentery, things like that. Uh, and diseases associated with overcrowding like typhoid, uh, typhus and scarlet fever. The top graph shows interest in those diseases, those classes of diseases, in the era, which is a paper we've been working with mostly, uh, as they change over time. And the second one shows crude death rates from those diseases as taken from uh, the Register General's reports, public health reports. What that's really telling us is that uh, there is very little correlation between uh, interest in diseases uh, and the amount of attention that uh, newspapers, or at least this particular newspaper, uh, paid to them. There is actually does seem to be a, a bit of a correlation with crowding diseases, but with the other ones in particular, uh, respiratory diseases are starting to drop away just when newspapers get really interested in them, uh, and there seems an almost inverse relationship with food and water diseases as well. That's kind of interesting. So what are the other collocations? Well, we can start to get into what else is being said about those diseases, why they're being talked about, and so on. One thing that came out of this, which surprised me a little bit, was just how important the, uh, the Crimean War seemed to be in interest in disease that were non-war associated, uh, particularly things like cholera and so on, which I don't think had really been picked up on before. However, that's for another day. Uh, this is then a map of where the era thought all diseases were interested in uh, in the 19th century. Uh, so there's an awful, I forgot exactly how many disease instances are in there, but it's tens of thousands. In some ways, it's a map of Britain's interest in the globe, but actually there's some quite interesting patterns on this. Diseases in India are almost always associated with not uh, terrible health conditions in India, but it's actually usually the deaths of individual colonial officials and military officials from a disease, particularly cholera. Egypt, though, is quite interesting. It's actually got very little to do with disease, or at least not in the conventional public health sense of the word. What's going on there is there's lots of adverts in which someone called the fruit salt man, who is purpo uh, purported to live in Egypt, said that this particular cure-all thing that he was trying to flog would cure all diseases. Uh, and that's being strongly associated with Egypt because of that. Uh, but what's kind of interesting about that is the kind of way that maps deceived to a certain extent, but they pose new questions, but having the text underneath them allows us to answer those questions. Finally, we can start to uh, home in on Britain, England and Wales in particular, because that's where they've got public health data for, and actually map out in a lot of detail where, where diseases are being talked about out of 330-odd million words of text in this case, but we've got far more to go. Uh, where, what diseases are being talked about, where they're being talked about, what's being said in relation to them, um, perhaps what is being said to try and get death rates from those diseases down, uh, and also because they're geographical, to compare them with quantitative evidence on what diseases are killing people in what locations uh, and uh, how those change over time. So at long last, about three years of, uh, of work in, we're actually in a position where we can start answering serious humanities uh, research questions about this. That doesn't mean that the work along the way is a waste of time, though. And to sum it up, this is kind of where I want to go, because I think this has got uh, some quite uh, serious implications for the way we think about digital scholarship. There used to be the idea that if you build it, they will come. In other words, uh, you, uh, you digitise a data set, you stick it up on a website, the scholarship will follow naturally. It isn't really, that is, that, to a point that's the case, although usually they won't actually acknowledge they've used the website, they'll pretend they've actually used the, raw, the actual source. Uh, but to a point that is the case. But actually if we're really going to use these things properly, we need a whole load of different stages with, that we explore that are on the technical level, uh, that are on the, the methodological level, and are also at the research level, uh, in the more traditional humanities style research questions level as well. And if we're really going to use these kinds of resources properly, uh, we really need to make sure that we invest in all of these stages and not just in the digitization stage. So I just want to finish by thanking uh, the people from the BL Labs group very much for all of their help on this, particularly James Baker, who's now moved on but uh, was incredibly helpful in the early stages of this. I want to thank Claire Grover for, uh, for her help and to say thank you for everybody who's worked on the Spatial Humanities Project over the last several years. Thank you very much. Thank you.